and introduce our colleague Alexander Ritzmann. Alexander is a senior advisor of the Counter Extremism Project in Berlin, where he works on internet regulations, such as the German Network Enforcement Act or the EU Digital Services Act, and on effective countering of extremist terrorist actors, in particular on violence oriented far right extremist transnational networks offline and online. Alexander is also advising the European Commission's Radicalization Awareness Network, RAN, where he particularly focuses on extremist ideologies, conspiracy narratives, and strategic communications. He has been closely monitoring the German violent right-wing extremist scene since the Russian invasion of Ukraine and has co-authored several CEP policy briefs on the matter. Alexander, very much looking forward to your analysis. The screen is all yours. Thank you, Han. So I'll dive right into it. Now, this quote here, don't your warrior to choose itch, is something I picked up from Casper. That's not really directed towards the German far right extremists, but it was a discussion in the far right uh, communities in Eastern Europe why so few of their brethren with their amazing Nordic warrior tattoos are joining them. And, and, and that sets the tone, I guess, uh, for the whole discussion about the quantity of far right extremists who have joined uh, the, the, the war either on the Ukrainian side or on the Russian side. Now, just to provide some context, CEP has been working on this issue for several years. We have uh, published a big report on transnational connectivity of violent um, far-right extremist uh, organizations and key actors, networks, financial structures. And there we also highlight the Azov movement and its role in their, their international department, so to say, but also their infrastructure for training foreigners, but also the Russian imperial movement and legion uh, doing basically the same thing. So for anyone who's interested in that, that's still on our website of CEP Germany. We did a follow-up into financial networks and activities. There's a real lack of analysis and understanding on the key milieus uh, within this uh, field the professional entrepreneurs of extremism. So there's a lot of amateurs that have no idea how to make money. And there are a couple of people who seem to know a lot and also probably are violating several tax laws and uh, might be involved in money laundering. And you can all see that in that report on our website. We then also found out that uh, most of those are still active on the big social media platforms. So they're not doing hate speech there. They're just making money. They just have all their online shops on uh, especially on Facebook and Instagram and on YouTube. And they're violating the terms of service of the platforms, but the platforms don't enforce their terms of service. And then of course we have this uh, recent report. Uh, so this is just to provide you some insights on from which perspective particularly I am looking at this. Now, in general, the discussion, oops, that was too fast. The discussion on uh, should Germans join that war? Um, there's a, let's say, a subculture of private military contractors that spoke out uh, quite early on that um, uh, they should not, Germans should not join uh, the, the, the war, right? So these are the, the guy on the left is uh, former of the French Foreign Legion. The guy on the right spent several years in Iraq and Afghanistan, and they said, the war will change you, stay at home, if you don't have military training, um, if you have not helped people before, so if you now suddenly want to become a hero, don't go there. So there was really not in this, let's say, pro-military milieus in Germany, there was not a lot of support in saying, yeah, we should all go there uh, fight. There was definitely hesitation. Now, the extreme right spectrum in Germany and the, the, our focus is where the violence orientation starts, right? So we're not so much into the identitarian movement, for example, but more in the National Democratic Party and then the mixed martial arts networks, the big con uh, concerts and music festivals infrastructure um, and all that. So this is the, 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 the focus of, of this analysis as well, the discussion here. And as mentioned before, that's um, here, Dennis Nikitin, White Rex, immediately uh, when the invasion started said, come to Lemberg, leave. Um, they have uh, 
provided some sort of support and infrastructure for Germans uh, to get there. Um, there's traditional German, um, traditional in the way that the actors have been active for a long time. The party's actually rather new. It's called the third path, the third way. Um, they are clearly pro-Ukraine and pro uh, Azov movement, for example, and other nationalist uh, actors. They have participated in activities in Ukraine before. So they have long-standing ties with uh, the far-right nationalist milieus in Ukraine. There's also this new uh, tiny party, party new strength, who's also very clearly uh, indicating that they are pro-Ukraine. The discussion was, of course, very confusing at the beginning, white against white, and then there was the Jewish president, but then the, the extreme right, the violence-oriented right, the majority that I was observing, right, there's only transparency to a degree here, but what I was uh, observing was that people were saying, okay, it's a Jewish president, but then again, he's staying and fighting, so I can have respect for this kind of Jew, and this was interesting, uh, so that's helped them adjust their narrative how to be pro-Ukraine when you're actually anti-Semitic. Then, of course, there was uh, the reporting about the Chechens um, uh, helping Putin marching. I mean, they have a huge social media department, obviously, the Chechens. There's lots of TikTok and other reporting of them shooting at bushes and rocks, uh, just yeah, simulating warfare, showing how tough they are. So they said, okay, he's sending Muslims, Putin, so obviously he cannot be our guy. And of course, they ignored that there is, as Kasper mentioned, uh, uh, actually a Ukrainian, um, uh, Chechen, uh, battalion, or at least there are Ukrainians, the Mansur battalion, and so on. And I've seen videos where Chechens are actually speaking German uh, when they're in the fight. So there might be Chechens from Germany or uh, Austria um, fighting at the moment. So in general, I would say that the positioning that took place in the first couple of weeks and that has been largely unchanged until now uh, was along existing ties and relationships. So if you were friends with uh, the Russian imperial movement before, or if you were a Putin fan before, you stayed with that side. And if you had more friends on the Ukrainian side, uh, then you uh, switched over to that side. And there's also some, uh, actually a quite significant segment that calls for neutrality and says we should not split up because there's a lot of uh, actual threats going on within the far right spectrum here to people who support um, Putin, for example, they're being threatened by people who um, uh, support Ukraine. So there's this discussion, we might be destroying the scene here, but so far this is uh, only on social media. It's, uh, I've not seen any real uh, life violence or any kind of other activity indicating that there's real infighting between or within the scene. Now, how does that support look like? We have someone from the uh, field of the identitarian movement who's embedded in a battalion, he does not, he does not uh, disclose uh, where exactly he is, and he, ha he does a combat diary. So he's a far-right uh, radical extremist. Uh, I don't know the person, right? So they're not really clear about who he is, but there's regular reporting. On the bottom here, you see PC records. That's a 20-year ongoing um, music dealership for extreme right music, and I took this picture to show how transnationally connected they are. Their estimated turnover per year at PC records is between 600 and 800,000 euros. And that's really a significant key actor who is supporting Ukraine. We have the third way that party I mentioned before who um, have traveled to Ukraine several times to deliver uh, um, armored uh, gear plates for the chess plates, for example, delivering in this way to uh, an Azov um, volunteer uh, group. So this is not the regiment. They are not in contact with the regiment. They're in contact with the Azov movement and affiliated uh, militants. Now, here again, we come back to uh, white rest. 
white rack some of you will know it maybe the longest running transnational mixed martial arts focused network in europe and beyond russian guy denis nikitin real name seems to be uh, kasputin um, is uh, behind this with a large network deeply connected with germans and others so this is what they used to do mixed martial arts when the war started they uh, said we asked everyone to come here's uh, directions um, so and um, there's clear indications that they were calling for people with military background to join them this is from a few weeks ago from their telegram channel so they seem to have moved from mixed martial arts to on the left that's a sniper rifle the other one is an assault rifle and their commentary is a liberal nightmare and this is Dennis Nikitin with an N-law uh, anti-tank weapon um, showing that he has access to these weapons so there seems to be a transformation here from this specific group they're just very transparent about it from a mixed martial arts to a military uh, equipment and approach. Of course, we have this Azov movement environment. I picked this logo because this is about hooligans and football fans, violent football fans, ultras, whatever, that um, post a, a lot of sympathetic um, information and also some of them claim to be in this voluntary part of the Azov movement, not with the regiment. And then, of course, we have the Russian side. So that's a picture from the Russian Imperial Legion. That's their military um, arm, so to say, um, which is integrated or affiliated with uh, the Wagner Group nowadays and the Russich Battalion. And that's from one of the pro-Russian separatist telegram channels who says this is made up of far-right Russian and other European volunteers and if you want to join them you have to go to Rostov right so there's obviously the same thing happening there's just basically very little to no research that I've seen on the movement uh, to the Russian side it's of course more difficult to get there uh, than to go to Ukraine but uh, there's definitely something going on now the militarization of white Rex is an interesting case study because this is on the left, that's a screenshot from a video that Dennis Nikitin has put out where he's basically saying that yes, Ukraine, there's a Jewish president and yes, there's gay parades and uh, you know, LGBTQ people, but that they have safe spaces to build the nationalist um, enclaves, communities. So they're saying everyone who's in doubt, everybody who thinks I don't wanna fight for a Jewish president still come here you cannot do what we can do here in Germany or in France or somewhere else so he is in a way promoting a some sort of state building narrative that while it's not great being an extremist in Ukraine it's better than in other places and of course white Rex, as I said deeply connected with this transnational professional far-right extremist network, for example, Kampf der Nibelungen, that's again mixed martial arts. You see in the middle the White Rex t-shirts, their sponsors of their events, and so on and so on. So this is something of uh, significant concern, that transformation from big mouthing, um, that they're going to be big shots to having access to military weapons and potentially combat experience. There's also left-wing radicals and extremists just to uh, show that side as well. Um, with support from Germany, I don't know how many uh, Germans have traveled there, but there's an ongoing logistical support similar to what others on the extreme right are sending to their brethren. They have their recruiting website that then directs you to the International Legion, but only if you fill out the questions about your ideological stand correctly. So they have a separate filter. They, they don't want to promote anyone. You have to be an anarchist to their liking. And this video I can highly recommend. Uh, you can find it on YouTube, Anarchists Against Putin. This is a bunch of different anarchists, Antifa fighters who say the narrative that there's a neo-Nazi problem in Ukraine, a significant one is bullshit. 
They're saying this is Russian propaganda. Russia always says that their enemies are either Nazis or terrorists to justify invasion. And of course, they have far right extremists, but uh, honestly, less than in other countries like Germany. So it's a very interesting perspective from the extreme left on the Russian propaganda narrative. Now, summary and observations. Um, the number that is being published by the German government on how many Germans far right extremists have left is in the mid two digits. It was around 40 in April. I have not seen an update that are supporting either the Ukrainian side or the Russian side. And I'm wondering if that number can be realistic. If we have almost 14,000 violent right wing extremists in Germany, according to intelligence reports, it is curious that supposedly only 40 left, but we will find out uh, one way or another. And important here is that a dozen, or that's also two or three months old information, a dozen or uh, now more, I guess, right wing extremists have already returned. To Germany. There's no self, this hero propaganda that we've seen with the Islamic State and the foreign fighters, selfies, videos, promotion by the foreigners. And this could be, mean, could be meaning many things, but it could definitely also be an indicator for professionalization and operational security. And there's very little posing like we've seen with white Rex, despite the fact that the German states, at least 40, the French states, 30 plus, and so on and so on. Well, the focus so far still, it seems, is disrupting travel plans uh, in Germany in particular without a sufficient strategy or sufficient legal tools. So the public announcement is we're going to do everything we, we can to uh, hinder German extremists from leaving. But then if you look what is actually possible, there's very little they can do. So most extremists will be able and probably have been able who wanted to go um, to go. This evidence of militarization um, of white wrecks, I've not seen any responses by authorities yet or in general regarding the topple of returning um, foreign fighters here in this context, uh, returning management and all that. There's, there's usually not a lot of discussion when we do briefings on this. Um, so I hope that authorities are picking this up and making this a priority. Because here, if we look at the individuals now, there is a potential high risk, right? So this could be motivation. Um, you have the ideology of far right extremism. You might have military combat experience. And if everything is going, you know, as it usually goes in war, there will be PTSD. And just to, call, to, to compare the Halle attacker, right, uh, in Germany, uh, far right extremists tried to enter a mosque and shoot the 70 something uh, uh, Jewish folks who were in the mosque, uh, sorry, the synagogue, obviously. Um, he couldn't go through the wooden door. He wasn't able with his self made weapons to go through the security door. Now imagine a bunch of guys with war experience coming back, uh, attempting the same thing. And I'm, I think we could be looking, and this is a theory, but based on what uh, I've been introducing here, maybe not without grounds, that we could look at uh, Bataclan scenarios, highly trained, uh, motivated, and uh, with access to military uh, weapons here. Recommendations, quickly. We need to prepare for this potential band of brothers coming back cooperation between governments and civil society, collecting information, uh, cooperating. This does not cost additional money right now. This is really just about information sharing, getting together, exchanging insights, and uh, preparing for those who will come back, and also for working with those who have come back, right? I mean, this is still the beginning of the conflict. To me and others here who have been working on this, these issues for a longer time, some might uh, recall the time when the beginning of the Islamic State, everyone was underestimating the threat. Everybody said, well, it's great. These guys are leaving. Hopefully they never came, come back, but a lot were coming back. So we need to prepare here. And if we prepare too much, that's not a problem. If we prepare too little, it will be. Tight cooperation between the member states, particularly regarding data sharing agreements is of course, uh, necessary and I heard somewhat starting 
Um, the returnee management needs to start when people leave for the war. We cannot wait until they return. And we just published a BP policy brief that we will send to you um, after this uh, meeting here, this webinar on some suggestions, lessons learned on how to do this based on the Islamic State returnees. And of course, that's my final point. I would recommend that there's an EU coordinated task force that really focuses on this militarization of some violent right-wing extremist actors like, like White Rex uh, in the context of the war here. So I would really feel better if someone would make this a priority and look into it. And so far I've not seen any indication that that's the case. Thank you so much.